today on Sabaton History. Part three of Soldier of Three Armies. Yeah. Oh, in case you didn't see part one or two, we are recording this over Skype because of the corona thing going on. And uh, yeah, that's why we're here right now. We'll Regular business will resume as soon as possible. As soon as we possibly can. And for now, enjoy part three of the saga of the soldier of three armies. This is part three of three of Soldier of Three Armies. Now, this is episode, like parts one and two, I am not filming at our studio in Bavaria. I'm filming in my home, in my living room in Stockholm, Sweden. And my friend Ryan is doing the camera. Say hi, Ryan. Hi, Ryan. It's still always funny. And our lighting is basically whatever lights we have from around my apartment. Okay, down to business. By the beginning of 1946, the world, on the surface, seemed to be finally at peace, but in reality it was no safer place than before. The Second World War was over, sure, but the fragile alliance between the United States and the Soviet Union had fallen apart. Now an iron curtain descended over Europe and soon separated the whole world into opposing ideological camps. Although Finland had once again preserved its independence, as we saw in parts one and two, the Soviet Union was slowly clenching Finland tighter and tighter in its grip. The Finnish Communist Party, now heavily funded from the USSR, was growing in strength and Soviet agents operated freely throughout Finland. Lauri Tony was now 27 years old, a well-known and well-respected war hero from two wars. But that put him in the sights of the Valpo, the Finnish political secret police. The Valpo was by now firmly under communist control. There had been several roundups targeting decorated veterans, high officers and politicians they found themselves under investigation for war crimes on orders from Moscow. 1,500 Finns were found guilty in show trials. In April, the Valpo arrested Lauri Terni. His cooperation with the German secret police was the only thing the Valpo could actually pin on him, but they accused him of planning to overthrow the Finnish government. He was sentenced to six years in prison for treason. It was not until December 1948 that Finland's now president, Juho Pasekivi, finally had the power to call off the witch hunts and pardon those who had suffered under them. Lauri Torni was a free man, but the country for which he had risked his life so many times had no place for him anymore. He was an ex-SS man, an ex-resistance fighter, and now also an ex-convict. Many of his old comrades had escaped the Valpo by fleeing to Sweden and from there across the world towards South America or the United States. Soon, there were little Finnish communities abroad that helped other Finns escape. In the first half of 1949, Tarni wrangled with the decision to leave. Finally, he packed his bags, took a friend's passport and made for the Swedish border. There, he forced a taxi driver at gunpoint to drive over the border and then Lauri Torni made a straight line for the Swedish immigration office. Once in Stockholm, he kept a low profile and he even fell in love with a woman named Maria Palm. They were soon engaged and even planned their marriage. Maria actually traveled to Finland to get Torni's uniform and medals for the wedding ceremony. But Lauri Torni could not offer Maria a future, not in Sweden, where Soviet agents were still on his heels. He decided that he would make his way to the US, but his borrowed passport would not allow him entry there. So he headed for Venezuela first. In March 1950, Tarni boarded a ship to Caracas, leaving behind the love of his life. In Venezuela, Tarni met one of his old Winter War commanders, who got him aboard a ship bound for the US. Off the coast of Alabama, Tarni jumped into the sea and swam to the shore. Now he was in the US, illegally, sure, but at least he was there. With barely enough English to make himself understood, he made his way to New York where the Finnish American community helped him with the immigration services. However, this was 1951 and Cold War America starring Senator Joe McCarthy. The fear of communist spy rings and double agents in all walks of life was a hallmark of an age of deep paranoia. Once more, Tarni's past caught up with him. In July 1951, 
the FBI arrested and interrogated Lowry Turney about his service in the Winter War, about the SS, about his prison sentence. Deportation seemed imminent, but at the last moment, a bill associated with the Lodge Act was pushed through Congress, allowing Turney and other persecuted foreign veterans to apply for citizenship through service in the U.S. Army. Lowry Turney filled out his Declaration of Intent and was sworn into the American Army. Since most Americans had problems handling the name Lowry Turney, and as a way to make a fresh start, Lowry Turney became Larry Thorne. Now, the U.S. Army was specifically interested in Winter War veterans. And the reason for that is that they were experimenting with a new branch of service, the Special Forces. It was expected that if the Cold War with the Soviet Union suddenly got hot, large parts of Europe would be overrun by the Soviet Red Army. So battles would be fought behind the enemy's lines through espionage, reconnaissance, and sabotage. For that, they needed veterans who already had experience with such methods. Cross the water, a new start. War still beating in his heart. A new legend has been born. Start a load of sarrasen. Some promoter will deserve. Change his name to Larry Thorne. By 1954, Larry Thorne was now 35, nearly twice the age of most other recruits, but he was still in excellent shape. The hardest thing in boot camp was actually learning the English language. After cold weather and mountain climbing training in Colorado, he was then sent to airborne school. By September, Thorne had passed all required tests and was accepted into the special forces at Fort Bragg. It was the beginning of the elite units known as the Green Berets, which we all know of, but whose mere existence then was still kept a secret. Fast forward to 1963, and post-colonial Vietnam was fought over between the Communist North and the American supported South. North Vietnamese guerrilla fighters infiltrated the South, attacking both South Vietnamese and American forces. They transported their men and material along their major supply route, known as the Ho Chi Minh Trail. However, most of the trail was hidden from the air, covered by thick canopies of jungle trees. For someone to destroy the trail, they'd need boots on the ground. Larry Thorne would be part of a specially schooled operational detachment known as an A-Team. Yeah, I know, I know. To fight the insurgency. This was what he had trained and lived for. Didn't matter if it was subarctic Karelia or the tropical jungles of Vietnam. His first assignment brought him to a camp near the Cambodian border called Chao Lang. And it was straight out of Apocalypse Now. Far away from the eyes of public or high command, Chao Lang was a lawless area. The camp had been attacked and nearly overrun 11 times in just the past month alone. As Thorne looked around the camp, he spotted a North Vietnamese flag on a hill nearby and made it his first mission to tear it down, to make it clear that there was a new sheriff in town. Officially, they were to respect the Cambodian border, but in reality, this was bandit country full of guerrilla fighters. Thorne immediately reorganized the system and ordered an aggressive stance against the enemy. His mantra that a good defense was a strong offense meant that he would attack the enemy wherever he showed himself. Similar to the winters in Karelia, the terrain dictated the battle in Vietnam. Brute force meant little inside the jungle. And once more, Thorne's daring and unconventional thinking showed results. He ambushed the ambushers and booby-trapped their supply routes. After his 180-day-long first tour in Vietnam had ended, he and everyone else in his team received the Purple Heart for wounds taken in battle, but they came back alive. Thorne was also awarded the Bronze Star for Valor. This would not be Thorne's only tour, though. American High Command wanted to deal the Ho Chi Minh Trail a crippling blow. This time, they planned on using small reconnaissance teams to infiltrate Laos, to locate Viet Cong supply depots, mark them for airstrikes. But since operations in Laos were political dynamite, they needed the best of the best. Larry Thorne was top of their list. On October 18, 1965, three King Bee Special Forces helicopters made their way towards the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Larry Thorne was now 46 years old, and this time he was only there to make sure that the insertion would go as planned. The three helicopters moved forward flying low above the treetops. But as they approached the landing zone, the weather went bad. 
Rain clouds hung like steamy curtains over the surrounding mountain ridges. Thorne was about to call it all off, but then the weather cleared for a moment and the men were dropped into the zone. Thorne's helicopter circled high above them. He chose to remain in place until the team leader gave the radio signal, but by then the weather had turned again. A storm was approaching. The King Bee was an old model with outdated instruments. At first, they were headed north. Another helicopter trying to follow their radio frequency noticed that they, they suddenly made a 180 degree turn. And then they were gone. The King Bee had vanished. Reports that Thorne was missing reached headquarters soon after. 56 search and rescue missions were mounted, but they found nothing. No crash site, no radio contact, not a trace of what had happened. So Larry Thorne was listed as missing in action. It was assumed that the helicopter had crashed in the jungle and there were no survivors. A year later, on October 19, 1966, he was officially declared dead. He was posthumously awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. Rumors, of course, circulated. People could simply not believe that Larry Thorne, Larry Thorne, the legend, had disappeared. Many hoped that he was still alive somewhere, but they also feared that he might have been captured by the North Vietnamese or worse, turned over to the Russians. Others half jokingly said that maybe he simply walked out of Laos and started a new life again somewhere else. I mean, he'd done it before. In the late 1990s, a task force finally found maybe something, a crash site not far from Thorne's last known position. There they found the remains of a crashed king bee. They located some bone fragments and teeth, but these were too old and too few for reliable DNA identification. They had also lost two other king bees in that area. So could this really be the right crash site? On September 7th, 1999, the remains were recovered and brought to the US, but in 2003, the files were officially closed. Who knows? Over the years, Friends and comrades met and remembered Lowry Tarney, a.k.a. Larry Thorne, a man who had excelled at combat literally like no one else, and a soldier of three armies. Uh, now, this is quite interesting because a few weeks ago we did Into the Fire uh, with Per, and that's your only song that's about the Vietnam War, like the whole song, right? Yep. But obviously what we just saw today is about events that happened in Vietnam. That's true, actually. I, uh, I, didn't think of, I hadn't thought of that, actually, but uh, yeah, that's where he ended his military career and life, I guess. Ha, ha, is there any special reason for you, or is it just a chance that you haven't written more songs about Vietnam? Because you've written a lot about World War II, for example. Oh, uh, uh, good question. No, no uh, I, I don't know, actually. Uh, there should be. I mean, so many stories yeah. come across from there, but I think it comes down to that we've turned into doing more and more thematic albums. Yeah. Like, uh, like we did now, The Great War. So uh, interesting to write something about the, like something from the, the the Vietnamese, like the Viet Cong perspective, since, you know, you have stories about not just about allied people in World War Two. You have songs about Germans, you know. Yeah, I mean, I always wanted to do two or three sides like we're doing three episodes about Soldier of the Armies. Now it would be so interesting to do uh, the same thing, but musically to cover uh, events from, from the same event. I same guess, events uh, okay. from the. Uh, from different perspectives would be really interesting musically, I guess. Well, and there's you know, so much tie-ins you can do musically as well, you know? Yeah. Uh, you could build the music as, uh, or you could have the pre-chorus uh, the same from both songs, but modulated. One could be in minor key, one could be in, in a major key. So they're sort of hinting at each other. And the major uh, key one could have the bagpipes, just like uh, <laughs> like that. <Paddock's laughs> I never forget that. That's the only song that you wrote in a major key. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Hey, but I did want to ask you about the actual song because in the other episodes, we didn't really talk much about the, the songwriting or how it was constructed or who it was with. Was this something you started with lyrics and then did the music or you had the song sitting around or how, how did this work? This, we started with the music and it's um, a bit of a different one because I remember 
uh, I was going to Poland or hometown basically and about to write some music and yeah. uh, I was planning to write with uh, one of our old old time uh, writing partners and people kept canceling on me so I thought what the hell I'll go to Poland anyway and just on a whim uh, like two days before I got in touch with Tuba we decided that let's try and see if we can write a song together you know and maybe they don't know who Tobe is. Can you tell? Ah, them? yeah. So I should tell. Uh, Tobe is our well previous guitar player. He was in the band from 2012 until 2016, if I'm not right. mistaken. And uh, this is in 2014. The thing with songwriters, I mean, I knew he could write music. Music. He'd written stuff before, but you never know if you're compatible as songwriters. Uh, sure. And, yeah. uh, it's kind of a fond memory for me this one because it's on this song we found out that we are compatible as songwriters. I mean, it shouldn't be a surprise. We're almost the same age. Uh, we like the same kind of classical 80s hard rock and metal. It actually started with me and Tub uh, not knowing where to start. And he started riffing in sort of the, I think we started with kind of the intro riff and we modified it. It was a bit, a little bit too much Judas Priest. I mean, there's Still a bit of Judas Priest in there today. Nothing wrong with Judas Priest. Uh, <laughs> yeah. a great band, you know, band we both love. Actually, it was a quick process and a really nice did, one. Did you write the lyrics yourself, though, or did he help you with the lyrics later? Or was that just you or well, you and Pear? Uh, that was me alone, I think. Could be me and Pear, but I think I wrote this one myself. Actually, not sure. You're going to have to look it up in the credits, anyone who's watching this, if you want to know. And now we've just spent three episodes telling the story. This is fun, our first trilogy. Thank you very much once again for watching Sabaton History. Thank you very much, and see you next week. See you next week. All right, you know what's coming now. It's me asking you for money. So, money, money, give me all your money. <laughs> <laughs>